Welcome everyone to our webinar. Uh, my name is Mark Newman. I'm the president of Precision Analytical. We're the makers of the Dutch test is how we're most uh, usually known. Um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a description of kind of the journey I've been on uh, while people uh, continue to trickle into the uh, the room here, so to speak. Um, and then we'll get into this topic of conversation. So my background is, an, is as an analytical chemist. So I've been on the measuring side of the hormone window uh, pretty much my whole career. So I've probably managed a couple million saliva tests and a little bit more than that when it comes to urine and have spent the last 20 years kind of just trying to figure some stuff out as it relates to that. Uh, firstly, you know, what's the best way to measure this, uh, this being reproductive and adrenal hormones. Um, and then, you know, that gets you into some situational things, right? Because there are situations where urine testing is your best option. There are situations where uh, serum testing is your, your best option. There are situations where saliva testing uh, is unparalleled in terms of the information that we're trying to gather. And and then you get into, uh, after you've had that conversation, then you kind of have to start the conversation all over again when it comes to HRT and start to ask some questions about what route of administration we're talking about and we prefer from a clinical standpoint and then to enter enter into the conversation which can be a little bit on the complex and confusing side, which is given a particular scenario, what's the best way to measure hormones? And the scenario that's given me the most confusion over the years, which I think is from my observations true of the industry at large, is this itch situation with transdermal hormones. So talking about adding a, a cream or a gel into your therapy, progesterone, testosterone, estrogen, and then you get pretty um, different results, right? When you're, whether you're looking at saliva or urine or serum, right? If you use a testosterone injection, you're gonna get about the same response, relatively speaking, in a saliva, a urine or a serum sample. It's a pretty intuitive situation and we can all kind of make sense of it. Then you switch to um, a hormone gel and now the saliva response is much, much larger than what you see in serum or urine. And so we've tried to kind of um, understand that over the years. And I've spent the last 20 years, really the entirety of my career, at some points more intensely than others, but digging into this question. And I spent the last several months really intently and intensely in the literature uh, trying to understand this at a higher level. Um, because for us, it's a question of like, how do we provide the best testing solution, right? We started our lab doing just urine testing and we said, oh, we've got a pretty good thing here. We've got comprehensive metabolites, we've got your cortisol pattern, we've got melatonin and some organic acids and it was a nice little model, but there are these voices that are saying, look, the cortisol awakening response, if you look at that in saliva, it offers a unique window you don't have. And so we gave into that because it's true and it's correct that um, doing saliva for cortisol. So now we do cortisol in both urine and saliva. So our Dutch complete is an all urine panel and our Dutch plus is the same urine panel, but with the cortisol story coming, at least the free cortisol from saliva, which also includes the cortisol awakening response, which is some really terrific data. So at the same time over the years, we've had this conversation as an industry um, and some would say when you want to look at monitoring hormone creams and gels that are taken transdermally saliva offers a unique message that you need to have and so when we dug into that topic or i dug into that topic uh, extensively for me it sits in the category of medical mythology meaning that it's been widely accepted at times by really large percentages of the industry, but when you really put it to the test and look at what the literature says and what clinical studies say, um, I think we find something different than what's been proposed uh, over the years when it comes to this whole conversation. So that's what we're gonna get into uh, today. So let's begin. I'm gonna grab, if I can here, my highlighter because I like to use that as we're going through this. So what are we covering? We're gonna look at identifying and evaluating this controversy using and monitoring transdermal HRT. We're gonna look at differences in that creams and gels are different than patches when it comes to the labs. 
this whole issue of creams and gels providing these really big numbers, it doesn't happen in patches, which is interesting. As well, we want to differentiate between what happens with estrogen and testosterone compared to progesterone, which behaves differently in this scenario. And then we want to try to identify some best practices when we're using HRT and monitoring HRT in light of the scientific reality. So before we do that, let's have a, just a brief conversation about what we want to do for a baseline, right? So before we test, we want to see if we can find a baseline. And when we, when we do that, serum testing is going to work well. Um, I would highly recommend for serum testing, particularly for HRT, that you're using LCMS. Um, if you want to look at a little study that sort of encapsulates why I would uh, recommend that, here's a study where we're looking at LCMS values on the x-axis here, and then basically an amino assay on the y-axis, and you can see they agree, right? Then when you move to the right, what we're doing is we're, we're zooming in on the region down in here, which starts to fall apart. So these amino assays don't really do very well when you get below about 20. And part of the challenge with salivary testing is we're going even further than that with similar technology um, and the values in serum are better assessed by LCMS, particularly when you're down in those postmenopausal regions. The Dutch test, so our test is a dried urine test for comprehensive hormones. <clears throat> the reason that we use the methods that we do is that we find really nice accuracy all the way down to those really low levels, and then we get to add in the metabolites. So we looked at estradiol and progesterone in our dried urine assay, and we found statistical equivalence with a good accurate serum test. We also found statistical equivalence with our four spot method compared to a 24 hour urine collection and with dried compared to liquid. And that's what we published in this paper, which shows these nice hormone patterns throughout the menstrual cycle and with postmenopausal women looking at really similar values when we're looking at serum <clears throat> with a good sensitive method or our urine test. Now with saliva testing, um, it's not my first choice when you're looking at a baseline test for reproductive hormones. Again, it's terrific for cortisol, uh, but I think we have better options when it comes to sex hormones because the accuracy is not easy to do well when it looks to saliva, when we look at saliva. So there are a few publications, these are the, um, the two best that I could identify, that do conclude, uh, particularly the one on the left of this, this Wong uh, study from 1990 shows serum and saliva correlating very well. Now, the sensitivity of the assay goes to about here. So that's the sensitivity of the assay. And you can see all these values up in here correlate really well. But two things to notice. One, these are all premenopausal women. So they don't get down into the postmenopausal range, which is mostly below the detection limit of the assay. But the other issue is this is a manual, very sensitive assay. So when people start commercializing salivary assays, they don't use assays that are this sensitive. So we really still have to establish that there's good serum correlation. The only published data from a commercially available assay that I've located where we're looking at saliva and serum is this paper, which showed that there was not good statistical equivalence looking at saliva and uh, in this case, plasma. And I think that's predominantly because this assay lacks the sensitivity. Now, don't get me wrong, there are more sensitive assays uh, than this one that are that are available. None of that data has been published, uh, but they tend to struggle at the lower end, meaning less accuracy. But ultimately, when we're talking practicalities, there's just less differentiating power. So let me show you a little study that we did that kind of highlights that. So we looked at serum in postmenopausal women. We got these low values. When we looked at premenopausal women, the values were higher in the follicular phase, which you'd expect. In the luteal phase, even higher yet. And then during ovulation, uh, we threw in one pregnant person just uh, because it was interesting. But what you see is this stair step of values. That's the biological reality as you transition through these different stages that females find themselves in. And that is reflected in a good, accurate serum assay. When we looked at the same samples or the same people collecting on the same day with saliva, what we found is that in the more sensitive assays, you did start to see some differentiation between these elevated values and let's call these normal. 
But what we didn't see in any of the assays is the ability to well differentiate postmenopausal, which are the hormones sufficient or deficient, from the hormone sufficient, which is the luteal group. When we looked in urine, we see the same reality that we see in serum, right? Which is that these normal women are well separated from these deficient women. And this one it was sort of an interesting story because she's close to hormone sufficient. And her story was postmenopausal, but obese and inflamed with low SHBG and insulin resistance, which gives you what? All told gives you more estrogen than your peers. And what we really wanna be able to do is to look into this whole system and be able to differentiate between hormone excess, hormone sufficiency, and hormone deficiency. And we need a powerful tool in order to do that. And my experience has been that a, an LCMS assay and serum or a good accurate urine assay is probably the better way to do that when we're looking at a baseline test. Now, that doesn't answer the question of what is the best window into the clinical reality when we're on transdermal hormones. When you use transdermal hormones, uh, it gets complicated. So over the years, this has been kind of a 20 year journey for me of trying to figure out when you move from oral progesterone to patches and pellets and injections or transdermal estrogen or testosterone, all these different scenarios, you have to evaluate them independently and ask the question of how, you know, what happens in urine, what happens in serum, what happens in saliva. My conclusion from that study is that um, saliva doesn't provide the best option in these scenarios. So I didn't include it on this particular version of this chart, but more specifically with transdermal estrogen and testosterone, that's what we're going to look at today is why do I think that urine and serum have a better representation of what's going on there and also why would I conclude that none of the lab tests that are available really give you good feedback when it comes to transdermal progesterone but one of the things that we need to recognize is that not every HRT scenario has a lab solution right there are certain situations where one test may work where another test uh, may not but there are also solutions where laboratory testing doesn't really give you a lot of good insight so a good example of that is sublingual hormones. So I'll just give you this as an example. So three of the problems you'll find when you're trying to monitor hormones are pharmacokinetics. So if it's too fast, it's hard to measure, particularly in serum or saliva, where it's just a spot measurement. So with sublingual hormones, you can see this up and down pattern gives you different levels of testosterone in women. But this is 60 minutes, right? Even at 60 minutes, there's there's not much of a difference between the three doses. So it moves so fast, it's hard to measure well. So serum is not a good answer for monitoring sublingual hormones. Now, what about urine? With urine testing and sublingual, the problem is when you swallow hormone, you get this first pass, of first, first pass effect, and it doesn't become a good tool either. So here's a, a real life example of someone who's got really high levels of estrogen, progesterone and testosterone that's taking all three sublingual. These are urine results. So the way we do our testing is this little purple band is the postmenopausal range. This is the premenopausal range, which ends at 4.5 and she's at 27. Wow, that's a lot of estrogen, right? Then we tested her again and said, this time don't take it the day of testing. And now she comes way back down here and the other hormones are where they are. Question is, do, do any of these values matter? Well, they don't. And here's what happens. The stomach in this situation represents the gut. Okay, so if we take HRT orally, it goes in the mouth, of course, add that into the stomach, into the gut, right? So what happens? Well, if it's estrogen, we get a whole bunch of estrogen in the gut. Is it in circulation where it can do something? Not yet. Now, a small fraction of it, way less than half, is going to get through the gut unchanged and have a biological effect, right? So all the hormone that's in systemic circulation has an impact. Now, a lot of that is bound up by binding proteins like SHBG. That's what we measure in serum. A fraction of it gets conjugated and becomes a urine conjugate. So estradiol glucuronide, that's what we measure in urine. And then there's a salivary component. These three measurements matter. They count, right? But there's still a whole bunch of it in the gut. And in the gut, it's going to get turned into metabolites and then conjugated. Now it's no longer in its active form. Right, so it doesn't really count, 
but it's there and the body's got to get rid of it. So those conjugated forms of hormone are going to find their way into circulation, having been changed already in the gut, and they end up in urine. So essentially the urine is flooded with a value that doesn't really count, if that makes sense. So first pass metabolism makes a urine test not work very well for sublingual hormones. So a high result doesn't mean you have too much and a normal result doesn't mean that you have it right. It's not a good option in that situation. Urine testing also is ineffective for oral estrogen, oral testosterone, not a good testing option for those scenarios. So sublingual hormones, none of the testing uh, models are gonna work. For saliva, just to kind of close the loop on this, uh, I put a picture of a tele or telephone pole, a, a, the flag pole on the football field there. Um, why? Because the distance between one end of the football field to the other, if that represents the amount of hormone in your saliva, the distance between the end of the football field and the sun, which you can also see in this picture, represents the amount of hormone you would put into your mouth if you were taking a sublingual hormone. So I have this tiny little amount in my oral fluid, and then I flood the area with all of this hormone because I'm trying to get some of it into circulation, which means you have what problem? The contamination problem. You cannot overcome that contamination problem and use saliva testing to measure sublingual hormones. So here's a situation where yes, you can take sublingual hormones, but the lab testing doesn't really work very well. So let's get back to this issue of transdermal hormones. So making the assumption that we don't know if anything works until we've really put it to the test. Is saliva testing better um, a better way to monitor transdermal hormones. So again, after looking at the issue and really digging through uh, as much data as I can find on this topic, I don't think this is a model that we can really use to give meaningful feedback for monitoring therapy. So why? There's been lots of confusion over this, right? Because these elevated salivary values make the interpretation very difficult. Let's try to see if we can make sense of it. So pretty much everyone would agree that when I take transdermal progesterone, the increase in saliva, whether it's on your foot or on your arm or wherever you put it, the salivary value is going to be much, much bigger or the increase in saliva is much bigger than in serum, right? If I move to testosterone, it's still much bigger, but to a lesser degree. And with estrogen, same thing, so, but even less so. So meaning what I get in, in terms of a response in saliva for estradiol is going to be higher than the response you see in serum, but that's going to be even more exaggerated as you move to testosterone and then to progesterone. If you want to see some actual numbers on this, progesterone is going to move from 20 to about two, 3,000 in a postmenopausal woman with 20 milligrams. In serum, really no significant change. In testosterone, I'm going to move with 50 milligrams from about 50 to about 3,000 in saliva and from about 250 to 400 in serum. So a significant change, but way less. And then in estrogen, you can see what sort of change you'd get there, right? So we're going in saliva from low to way above normal for all of these hormones. In serum, the progesterone doesn't move very much. It's gonna stay with a low value at 20 milligrams or 80 milligrams or most of the normal doses you would use. Whereas the testosterone and estrogen at let's call them moderate to high doses, they're gonna move you from a value that's low to a value that's normal. The urine is gonna follow this same pattern. So if we said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. Everybody's gonna follow the same philosophical approach. It, when you were a young man, you made this much testosterone. Now you're 65 and your levels are lower. We're going to restore your youthful testosterone. So I wanna give you a value that is what it used to be, right? If I give you an injection, the saliva testers, the serum testers, the urine testers are all going to end up in about the same place in terms of dosing. But if you do that with, with topical or transdermal creams or gels, you're going to get really different doses, right? So with progesterone, you'd end up using a really low dose with saliva. If we just focus on testosterone to sort of simplify it, if you use saliva, you're going to probably end up at the most 10 milligrams. But if you use serum or urine, you're gonna end up using 50 or more milligrams, right? So we have to figure out which one of these is right. So let me first just lay this out. This is what I think three big assumptions that's led to an industry that has, I think, concluded incorrectly uh, at times about this topic. First assumption, progesterone behaves the same as testosterone and estradiol. That is not true in this scenario, okay? 
When considering creams or gels, progesterone behaves differently. Serum and urine levels increase linearly and with dose dependency for testosterone and estradiol, not for progesterone. Okay, let me show you the data on this. Okay, so here's a low dose of estrogen. I've moved from the postmenopausal range in a urine test and I've increased the value. If I take the dose up threefold higher, the values go up about threefold higher. If I do the same thing in progesterone, okay, I'm in the postmenopausal range, I take 20 milligrams and it moves just a little. And then I say, all right, let's be aggressive and take the dose up tenfold. The value barely moves, right? It doesn't get up into the normal premenopausal range. It's not moving in a linear dose dependent manner like it is with the estrogen. Now, if I wanna look at testosterone, let's look at serum. In serum, here's a study where they gave men anti-androgen therapy. So they dropped their, just for the sake of the study, they dropped their baseline way down here to like a female level. And then they gave them 10 milligrams, 50 milligrams, et cetera. What do you see? Linear dose dependent response. You don't see that with progesterone. If you were to do this with progesterone, you'd get a low value in women, a low value, a low value, even up to 100 milligrams, all the studies you look at, the highest value you're going to see is just a blip above a baseline. You're never going to get into the normal range with transdermal products, but you do with testosterone and you do with estrogen. So they behave differently. Second assumption that we have to, I think, get away from if we're going to understand this properly is estrogen replacement must return levels to premenopausal norms. That is not true. So on our test, again, this is the postmenopausal range down here. The premenopausal range, here's the middle of it. When people shoot for that value, they end up using too much hormone. What we know is that we only have to get out of the postmenopausal range to start to see clinical significance. We can learn that by looking at patch data. So 0.025 milligram of a patch. So if I look at our data and I look at the low dose patch, there's the value right there. So 0 0.025 milligram of a patch. Here's what's significant about that. If you look at saliva data, serum data, or urine data, this dose of a patch leaves the average woman short of the premenopausal range. So even in saliva, they do not on average get up into the premenopausal range. Serum, same thing. Yet, you get bone mineral density increasing and you get separation from placebo with hot flashes, meaning what? It works. It's clinically effective, but you're not up into the middle of the premenopausal range. You don't have to give that much estrogen in order for it to work. And the assumption that you do has really clouded this issue. We'll explain that a little bit more as we go on. And then the biggest issue is making the assumption that because the saliva gland is a tissue, that saliva or oral fluid then acts as a surrogate for all other tissue. These three assumptions are not true. And when we, when we uh, remove these assumptions, I think we can find a better understanding of what's really going on with transdermal hormones. So let's use testosterone as an example and kind of work through the data. And I think this will make uh, a lot more sense. Okay. If I use saliva, 10 milligrams at the most is usually what people will say works because the values are going up so much, right? If I use serum or urine, I'm saying, no, no, I need 50 milligrams or more. How do I know which one's right? We have to ask the clinical data, okay? We have to look at clinical data to differentiate and figure out what's going on. What we can't do is you cannot ask the patients, do you feel better? That's not enough evidence for this. Let me show you why. Here's a study where they're giving estrogen and you can look at vasomotor symptoms. So hot flashes at 12 weeks are a lot better. Now, if on top of giving this therapy, this is what we call our pillars of health. So Dutch represents adrenal and reproductive hormones. And then you as good, smart clinicians have to figure out what's going on with the gut, um, you're going to have to figure out cortisol. You're going to have to figure out insulin and all of that. If you treat them well, in addition to giving them estrogen replacement therapy, this symptom relief is probably going to get even better, right? But this is the placebo arm of an estrogen study, meaning if you give someone a placebo and then treat other things that are wrong with them, yeah, they're going to feel a, a lot better whether the therapy's working 
or not in some cases, meaning we have to search through the clinical data to understand what's really going on. We can't just rely on whether we feel like our patients feel better or not. That's not to discount the importance of that. Obviously, you're going to want to hear from your patient in terms of how they're doing with their therapy, but when we want evidence as an industry, we've got to dig a bit further than that. And when I did that, the clinical data spoke really loudly on this issue. When considering transdermal testosterone and estrogen, dozens of studies show the clinical outcomes paralleling the increase seen in serum or urine. To date, and this is, this is literally hundreds of hours of digging through studies, I have not yet identified a study where the exaggerated response in saliva parallels what's going on clinically with testosterone and estrogen. So let me show you a couple examples. I think this will make a lot of sense. So what am I looking for? Well, I'm sifting through the data and saying, show me a study where they looked at things that happen when you increase testosterone. Erythrocytosis goes up, LH goes down, bone mineral density increases. And what I found is that with every study I could find, the clinical endpoint dance with the serum results. The bone mineral density moves along with the serum results when it comes to estrogen in women. When it comes to men, all of these factors seem to move uh, congruently with what's going on with serum. So let's go through just a couple in detail, and I think you'll see what I mean. With erythrocytosis, if we look at saliva, a 50 milligram gel increases levels about 1,500%. That's a lot. That's a really big increase, obviously. If you give the same gel and look at serum or urine, it's a moderate increase. Now, when we look at erythrocytosis as an endpoint, 50 milligram gel increases erythrocytosis five times less than a typical injection. If saliva was correctly representing what's going on, you'd expect a massive increase of erythrocytosis, at least rivaling what's going on with an injection. If you increase the dose to 100, you get more erythrocytosis, as you'd expect, still less than a typical injection or pellet, right? So the data seems to move along with the serum and the urine. LH suppression, if I give a lot of testosterone, LH should come down. Again, big salivary increase, moderate decrease or increase in serum and urine with the testosterone, what happens to LH? Well, if I take a hypogonadal man, his LH will be what? It'll be elevated. If you then give a 50 milligram gel, it doesn't act as if it's getting this massive bolus of testosterone. The, L, the LH simply slips into the normal range from elevated to normal, a moderate change. If it really was a 1500% increase of what's going on, you'd expect the LH to really reduce dramatically and it doesn't. Here's a real practical test. What if we look at studies where they use 10 to 30 milligrams of transdermal testosterone? So Testagel in one study, Androgel in these two studies on the right. Now think about it. If I can use five to 10 milligrams of testosterone in a man and I increase these sort of masculinity symptoms because it's a lot of testosterone as implied by the elevated salivary values, certainly if I give an, an even higher dose to a woman, I should expect to see some negative outcomes. None were seen in these studies. Let me contrast that with this. Here are two studies in women both using 50 milligram gel. Now the one on the left, they only used it once or twice a week and I don't think it absorbed quite as well because what they found is the levels went from a low female level to a normal female level and they got an improvement in things like sexual function but they didn't get any negative side effects. The study on the right is a transsexual uh, study where they're looking at female to male transitions. And so in this case, they're actually trying to induce secondary sex characteristics that you normally see in men in these patients. And do they find success? Yes, they do. And what do you find in serum is you see a typical male level. So meaning when I compare and contrast these two studies, I see male symptoms emerging when male levels are seen in the serum. But you'd expect in both of these studies to find really, really high salivary testosterone using a 50 milligram gel. So we see again, uh, some sort of harmony between what's going on in the serum and uh, what's going on with the treatment. Here's a study looking at it from the other angle. Here's a negative study, right? They didn't succeed in this study. So they gave men testosterone, 
usually this dose of testosterone gives improvement in bone mineral density, but not this time. Sexual function, but not this time. And usually they get a, a bump of about 250. In this study, they got a bump way less. What does that mean? Well, it seems like it wasn't absorbed very well and it didn't work. But 80% of men who take 100 milligrams have a salivary T that's 10 times normal. So in this case, and this is what's frustrating about research is of course they didn't do salivary testing in this particular situation, but it's fairly safe to assume that these men would have really big salivary testosterone levels and yet it failed, meaning what happened clinically really seemed to move pretty well with the serum testosterone. Here's some salivary data from a salivary lab looking at the levels of salivary testosterone in women and looking at their symptoms. Okay, so what you find here is symptom severity on the y-axis, and then we have the salivary level on the x-axis. So each point is not a woman. Each point represents hundreds of patients. So the normal range is 10 to 50. So what happens if we give you as a woman salivary or topical testosterone, and then we look at your level? Well, if this is working clinically, we would expect the women that get out into this region, which is a male region, to start having symptoms that are typical of a male, right? Facial hair growth. But what we find is even the women, and again, this is hundreds of women, who end up twice as high as a normal male in the range that a man would find using about five milligrams, we don't get any increase in symptoms, right? So these women wouldn't expect to have really high serum levels. The symptoms aren't going anywhere, right? So it's all making sense when we overlay the clinical picture in these studies with the serum values. Now, let's move on to estrogen for just a brief time. The serum and the urine levels, as we, as we show, seem to matter or seem to correlate better with the clinical picture than does saliva. What I found in, in looking at the data from estrogen is the serum and the urine levels seem to matter more than the dose that we're using. So here's what I mean by this. If I use 0.25 milligrams of Dibby gel, meaning the FDA studies on Dibby gel at 0.25, it doesn't work quite as well as a 0.025 patch. Meaning when I look at the hot flashes at four weeks, the Divi gel has not separated from placebo. At, at eight weeks, it does. When I look at the patch, it separates from placebo at both four weeks and eight weeks. Now, if I increase the dose, and instead of using 0.25, I use 0.5, then I get success at both four weeks and eight weeks, which means that it's just barely starting to match the efficacy of a 0.025 milligram patch. When I ask the same question of Eva Mist, it takes a 1.5 milligram dose to have partial success and a higher dose to have complete success matching a 0.025 patch. And the serum levels agree with that level of success. Now, Here's an interesting point. You might look at this and say, why in the world would I use so much more estrogen in a gel than I would in a patch? This is actually four milligrams of estradiol. When I give you a patch, I'm giving you about four milligrams. The 0.025 is the effective dose from watching those serum levels go up. So keep that in mind. Whenever we talk about patches, we're talking about effective dose. Whenever we talk about creams or gels, we're talking about the actual dose. So let's look more carefully at the estrogel data because I think this is, starts to be helpful. So here on the top, you can see a quote from somebody who's trying to explain from a pro saliva position. The data clearly shows that to achieve in serum a premenopausal level, you have to use a really big dose, they're saying, right? So one to three milligrams with topical estradiol as reported. Now this study 14 here is the Brennan study. So what we see here, is that if you use 0.375, you get around 24. So the baseline's around five. So I move you from five to 24. If I use a higher dose, uh, I get up in the 30s. And to their point, you have to use three milligrams to get into the luteal range. Now that's from a different study. Uh, but again, you have to use really big doses to get into the luteal range. Here's the actual data, okay? So three milligram gel, puts you up at about 125. One and a half milligram gel puts you up at around 75. And then from a different study, we can see that 0.75 puts you here and 0.375 puts you in this range. So you do see a linear dose dependent response 
when you use estrogel. The question is, how do we know when the dose is right? Well, let's overlay with this data a patch. Okay, we know a 0.05 milligram patch works. In fact, a 0.025 milligram patch works. So do we need the estrogen to climb clear up to these levels? So to that author's point, we don't need this much estrogen, right? We don't need to be up in these luteal levels using three milligrams of a gel because we know that serum levels in this range will work. So a lower level of estrogen when we're using serum testing, it will, it will lead us to a dose that actually makes sense. Now, if we ask the same question using saliva testing, what we can, what we can see is here you've got saliva data. So the patch goes from the postmenopausal into the premenopausal range. So here's a 0.1 milligram patch. Now, if we use about 0.75 milligrams of a topical product, 12 hours after dosing, we get around a 10. And at eight hours, we're probably higher than 20. And at 24 hours, we're at around five. So what that means is the salivary value spends the entire day between three times what a high dose patch puts you at and 10 times. So does that represent the clinical reality, right? Is 0.75 of estrogel really this massive dose of hormone? And that's where we have to look again at the clinical data. So when we use patches and we're looking at bone mineral density, here's your placebo, okay? Bone mineral density decreasing. At six months and 12 months, all of these doses work, right? The more estrogen, the better bone mineral density, but they all separate from placebo at six months. The saliva data tells us that the 0.75 milligram dose of estrogel is this massive, massive dose of hormone. The serum data says, no, it's not actually that much hormone, as does the urine data. And what we find is that the bone mineral density agrees with that. When we overlay the bone mineral density, it overlays with the serum data, not with the saliva data that has this exaggerated response. So 0.75 does not separate from placebo at six months, but at 12 months it does. So it's just barely enough hormone to get the job done. If we use more estrogen, then we get separation from placebo at six months and 12 months. So it took 0.75 milligrams of estradiol to achieve serum levels of around 30, but it raised saliva levels way above the luteal range. But again, it barely worked in terms of its clinical impact, which puts it in alignment with the serum and the urine data. So when do trans, this is the big question, when do transdermal estradiol products succeed? And what we find is that when we start to get out of the postmenopausal range, these are the doses where we find success. So if I zoom in on the urine data, these are the doses of creams, gels, and patches. Now there's not a lot of data on creams in terms of clinical impact, but with gels and patches, what we find is as soon as we pop out of the postmenopausal range, we start to find success. If we use a higher dose, we get a higher value, and we also see more clinical success, whether we're talking about hot flashes or whether we're talking about bone mineral density. So using this as a tool and using a target value of about this range right there is a model that we can reliably use to monitor HRT of these forms and have success. So yes, I think you should choose a lower dose of estrogel, 0.75 over three milligrams just like you should use a 0.025 milligram patch to start and not 0.2. That would be taking two high dose patches and putting them on at the same time. Why would we use those lower doses? Because the clinical response, the serum and the urine all align that imply that those lower doses make sense. And that's where we find this uh, coming together of the clinical data from the labs and from the clinical data from the endpoints of, again, bone mineral density, hot flashes. Okay, so in a thorough study of the scientific literature, I haven't found any studies where the clinical impact of transdermal testosterone or estradiol outpaced the response that we see in serum or in urine. And that's a big, um, a big conclusion. So for us, we're always evaluating, you know, do we need to provide a salivary test of cortisol? Yes, we do, because it provides unique information. Do we need to do that for testosterone or estradiol? 
because of this, um, we think we're better off with a urine test for these in terms of looking at the values and looking at the metabolites. Now, there is one place where we do find congruence. The clinical endpoints have not moved with the salivary values, but there is one place where we do see this phenomena like a line, which is really interesting, is that when blood spot testing is done, we see a very similar response that this is testosterone. So testosterone does this. When you take uh, transdermal testosterone, it goes up in a fairly linear manner and blood spot does similarly. So even with 10 milligrams, the blood number is really, really big, right? Now, testosterone is going to move in serum, again, in a linear dose-dependent manner, but it's exponentially higher in blood spot. Again, when we look at the clinical data, we're not finding any data that's telling us that this value of super physiological response at a fairly low dose of 10 milligrams is actually aligning with what's moving clinically. But if you said, look, I think these values make sense, but we need to adjust our reference range. Like, let's use a higher reference range and see if we can make that work. There isn't any clinical validation that we've ever seen that has said that that model works. But if we evaluated that and just said, okay, let's just like go down that road and, and ask whether this actually works. The first question is, is it reproducible? Like you're getting these really big numbers, but are they similar from day to day? So one of the studies that I was involved in that Frank Stanzik ran at USC, uh, was doing just this, is they, they were looking at a, a bunch of different things, but one of the things they had in the study was two values in a controlled environment that were both 24 hours post supplementation with transdermal progesterone. And what we found is the average value differed by about a factor of five from one day to the next. So sort of a worst case scenario would be patient number eight we can see here. So on day one, the blood spot was around 50, but the saliva was only around 200. So those are kind of different stories. Usually saliva is a lot higher. That's a really big blood spot. When the test was done again, 24 hours after the next dose, the value in blood spot went down by a factor of 10, whereas the value in saliva went up by a factor of 10. So there isn't really a story that is told reproducibly in these samples so far as we've seen from the data that would help us with that. If we want to see that same issue examined from the literature, here's a study by Wren where they looked at a bunch of different women. They looked at their values beforehand and said, okay, they're nice and low. Salivary progesterone, nice and low. And then we give them therapy for about 70 days and we're going to test them over two weeks. And you can see these ranges, right? This patient from 15 to 400, this one from 40 to 1200, from 550 to 4000. So there's a really broad range, but what they found is none of the women actually showed that there was a progesterone effect in the endometrium, right? So that's a really big deal. There's been one study that has shown, yeah, if you take transdermal progesterone, you see an impact in the endometrium. This study uh, conflicted with that, but also showed that there's a wide range of values over multiple days of taking this product so it's really hard to tie that to any clinical endpoint if it's not reproducible from day to day. So that's one problem with trying to use this model and following that. So after looking at all this data, this is the best uh, exam or let's say model that I've come up with with what makes sense for what's going on in this situation. I'm not sure this is entirely correct, but this is how I conceptualize it. The hormone is added, it goes through the skin, a certain amount penetrates, right? All the way into systemic circulation. So some of that ends up in blood. Some of that is going to get conjugated and that conjugated hormone is going to get in urine. Those are representative amounts from systemic. Then watch the hormone. It's going to migrate, maybe in the subcutaneous fat, maybe there's some lymphatic transport going on, but those values don't seem to have been in systemic circulation the way I would interpret that, uh, and this needs more data to support it, is that the saliva gland has special access to fat stored hormones. That's the best interpretation that I can come up with that explains all the data that we see. If that's true, that it has special access to fat stored hormones and that there's uh, some sort of diffusion of sorts that's getting into saliva, the following sets of data would help to support that. So this is just an N of one. This is one particular person who put hormone on uh, really close to the saliva gland and got really big testosterone values. 
And then they put it further away from the saliva gland and they got values that were much lower, which sort of gives you a picture of the hormone sort of diffusing, uh, if you will, into the saliva gland, not necessarily getting into systemic circulation. And note that that's a logarithmic scale. Those are much, much bigger numbers when you put the hormone closer to the saliva gland. So it starts to give us a little bit more information about how exactly that hormone might be getting into saliva. So the other bit of information that sort of um, was interesting to me in terms of this phenomenon is this is published data that says, okay, we give women transdermal progesterone and then we stop. And after the cessation of therapy, you can see 12 weeks later, there's still supraphysiological levels. Now keep in mind, throughout this whole time, urine levels of every metabolite you could find of progesterone are at baseline. Serum is at baseline, but you have this elevated salivary value, and we know progesterone is super lipophilic, right? So if the progesterone loads up the fat and the saliva gland has special access to it, and we see this slow degradation, can we assume that 12 weeks after therapy, that there's a supraphysiological amount of progesterone in the endometrium and in the breast tissue? It's not likely that that's true, and that's you know, I think worth considering when we're trying to understand this model. I've seen data where the salivary values are elevated more than six months later, right? So the saliva gland has something unique going on. Now, one bit of information that I found initially compelling was this. It, compelling in the sense of defending the use of saliva testing for transdermal hormones is I read the abstract and the abstract said, okay, this guy, Chang got a hundredfold increase in breast tissue with transdermal progesterone. Like, oh, that's very interesting because when you put transdermal progesterone on, you get about a hundredfold increase in saliva. So isn't that compelling in aligning with the saliva story? And then when I read the entirety of the paper, I said, like, oh, okay, this is not what I thought it was. Okay. If I put the four, the hormone on my forearm and a hundredfold increase dumps into the breast tissue, that's very compelling. But in this case, they put the hormone directly on the breast. So this can be a study that can be really confusing when you're trying to um, when you're trying to examine this. Is you know does this align with the saliva story of this massive increase in tissue? Not likely. It's more likely that in his study there was local diffusion of hormone. Right, you put all this hormone on the breast on the skin, and it diffuses into the local tissue. It's not likely that it's getting into systemic circulation and then dumping in at really high levels uh, into the breast tissue. So, saliva testing summary. This is where all of this data has led me, and for our lab as we pursue the best testing options to provide for different situations. I think there are better testing options for baseline because of the lack of differentiation that you see between hormone sufficient and hormone deficient women. I would rather use an LCMS serum assay or the Dutch test. It's not clinically relevant for transdermal creams and gels. That's the conclusion that I come to when I look through the literature, though I'm always looking for studies that help clarify this. So if you have uh, studies that help to clarify this that I haven't mentioned, uh, by all means, uh, my email address will be up at the end of the study, and I'd love to uh, to look at those. Um, you might have clinically relevant values for injections, patches, vaginal hormones, oral estrogens, meaning when I look at the data as objectively as possible, I think that the salivary value makes sense with what's going on clinically for those situations. But if you ask me to objectively look at what test is best, I think in each of those situations, you probably have a better option that's better standardized for serving as uh, a good representation of what's going on in that situation. Um, now, what about topical progesterone? What do we conclude about topical progesterone from this? It hasn't been shown to protect the endometrium. So it shouldn't be used alone to balance estrogen. Meaning, if I have a situation like a premenopausal woman who's anovulatory, meaning she's got normal estrogen but really low progesterone, you might think of a different way to supplement progesterone. But if she is making you know, some progesterone and you just want to augment that, it's not a bad situation. If you have a postmenopausal woman who's not on estrogen, 
maybe progesterone will help her. But if she's on estrogen, you're probably going to want to look at oral progesterone, which is well defended in the literature, maybe vaginal progesterone to help to ensure that the endometrium has enough hormone. Um, I'm going to skip over this. I'm running a little bit long. But basically, if you look at all the data, it seems to imply that you need about twice as much of a cream to get the same serum response as a gel. But it's very frustrating because there's very little data. If I look at serum, this is literally the only study that I have found to date where they looked at estrogen creams and serum. And what they found was, yes, the serum goes up but at a higher dose, and you have to be careful when you're measuring serum because it could be back to baseline in the latter part of the day. So timing is really important. This is why I think urine works better for creams because we're gonna collect the urine and it's gonna represent most of the day. And so I think that's a better option. But here's the bottom line for me. Dozens of studies have been found where the clinical impact of transdermal testosterone and estradiol aligns with the serum or urine response. I haven't found any studies that indicate the clinical impact of transdermal testosterone or estradiol exceeds the serum or urine response in alignment with what's going on with saliva. If you would like our resources, we have this chart to kind of help you navigate through that. For example, you don't want to use serum testing for oral progesterone, uh, but you do for other situations, and it'll kind of help explain that. We also have some position papers that we'll be making available soon that kind of walk through each of these situations to look really thoroughly at what the literature has to say about that situation. Um, Patches behave differently. We talked about that. For transdermal testosterone in men, I would start with serum as my anchor. Dutch is a nice complement. And for estrogen, I really think the urine test is the best way to go because of some of the, the reasons that I've mentioned. And we didn't even talk about metabolites, right? 2-hydroxy, 4-hydroxy, 16-hydroxy, methylation. You can look at all of that, all of that while you're evaluating the, um, the levels of hormones. So for the Dutch test though, it's all about comprehensiveness, right? We can look at all of these things. I'm not gonna go through them because I'm running short on time and I wanna leave a few minutes for questions, um, but it's really about comprehensiveness. It's cost effective. When we juxtapose that with what functional medicine providers are typically using, they start with serum. They don't like serum for saliva, which is, is wise. And so they put those two together. For us, we can look at all of that in one panel. So if you wanna look at serum, saliva, add an estrogen metabolism panel, add an organic acid panel, all of that is encompassed in the Dutch test, which really just gives you a lot more information to work off of uh, when you're looking at these complicated cases and when you're looking at HRT monitoring. So I am going to transition into trying to look at some of these questions, um, which I haven't opened yet. So give me just a second and I will see if I can... Um, find some of those questions. If you're interested in our testing, I think the Dutch test is a really nice option when you're looking for a cost-effective way to get comprehensive information. Um, one question that we had was simply, can we email the recording? I believe the recording will be uh, sent out to all the attendees, um, so don't worry about that. Um, we'll definitely make that available. Um, if you go to dutchtest.com, you can get a lot more information on this. We have a lot of videos that are available on our website that kind of explain some of these different situations. Like oral progesterone could be a pretty complex thing in terms of what happens in serum, what happens in urine, why do we promote the Dutch test for that? It'll kind of walk you through that. Um, and if you're new to us, you can get up to five tests at half price, which is a really nice little starter pack below our cost to just kind of give you uh, a window into where this test can fit into your practice. So let me see if uh, we have any more questions here. Could you repeat what values you're actually shooting for? So if I'm looking at estrogen, what I'm shooting for if I'm looking at serum is kind of that 20 to 60 range. And if I'm looking at the urine test, I'm looking for the same sort of range, which would be the top of the postmenopausal range up to the bottom part of the premenopausal range. So that to me is kind of the sweet spot. And then you say, well, where do I want to be in that? Well, it kind of depends on individual situation, right? If you have someone who's much more concerned about breast cancer risk than they are about, let's say, bone loss, then I would want to keep them on the lower end of that. And then of course, also monitor metabolites, um, 
for breast cancer, we've got a marker for oxidative stress, we've got cortisol, we've got melatonin, all of those play into the risk profile for uh, breast cancer. You want to look at all that. Now, if the woman on the other hand is saying, look, breast cancer is not my top risk. My mom has osteoporosis. My sister's, you know, struggling with that. That's older. I really want to protect my bone. You know, maybe you want to push up a little bit higher into the bottom part of that premenopausal range. Cause you can see from the studies that as you increase estrogen, you get more uh, bone mineral density uh, from the increased dosage. So, you know, you just kind of want to find it somewhere in that sweet spot and then, you know, tweak it to an individualized uh, response. What form of progesterone do you recommend? Now, again, this is coming from a chemist, but from looking at the research, you can really justify progesterone at 200 milligrams orally. We know that protects against, um, protects the endometrium. So the uh, the other one that works well, I think, is vaginal progesterone, but you can't defend it as well from the literature. There's not as much literature support for vaginal progesterone as there is for oral progesterone. But what you can't do is you can't give transdermal progesterone and know what's going on in the endometrium. Helene Leonetti's study was an interesting one in that they showed that when they gave topical progesterone, the endometrium seem to be protected. There were no biological measurements reported from that study. So it doesn't get us that far, but it's about a 20 year old study and we don't have any other studies to corroborate that, but we have multiple studies that contradict it. So we just don't have enough confidence to give progesterone and know what's going on in the endometrium, particularly when we know that typically the serum and the urine haven't really moved from their baseline. So, um, so that's what I, that would be sort of my approach to uh, the progesterone. So uh, thank you for listening. Uh, if you have any questions for us, feel free to email me at the email address there below. And again, I, I hope that if you have some studies that weren't included here that you think maybe uh, give added clarity to this issue. I've been searching for them for many years and trying to incorporate all of those into what we've found. And I have found uh, some some continuity in those in terms of, again, overlaying those with what we see in serum, what we see in urine, what we see in saliva, and finding uh, some, some continuity in those. And if there are some that seem to say otherwise, I would really, really enjoy looking through those to see um, how those might add some clarity to this picture. So again, thank you for uh, listening to our talk, and we look forward to working with you in the future.